Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hello and welcome to tonight's virtual Commonwealth Club event. I'm Brian Hackney with CBS News in San Francisco. Before we get started, we would like to thank Wonderfest for partnering with us on tonight's program. And it is a real pleasure to welcome our guest, Dr. Avi Loeb, best-selling author of Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth. Dr. Loeb is the Frank B. Baird Jr. Professor of Science and former chair of Harvard's Astronomy Department. He's also the founding director of Harvard's Black Hole Initiative and director for the Institute for Theory and Computation. Over the course of his career, Dr. Loeb has authored more than 700 articles and produced pioneering research on black holes, on gamma ray bursts, and the early universe. But, his provocative stance on the first known interstellar object to visit our solar system has raised more than a few eyebrows. In short, after decades of searching for evidence for extraterrestrial intelligence, this Harvard astronomer suggests that the evidence has found us. There's a lot to talk about in the next hour, and we want you to ask uh, Dr. Loeb your questions, if you're watching along with us, please put those questions in the text chat on YouTube. I'm sure you've been through this before and we'll be getting to them later in the program. But first, it's a real pleasure as one who ground the lens for his own telescope when I was in high school to say, Dr. Loeb, welcome and thank you for making time for us today. Thank you so much for hosting me. It's a great pleasure. Uh, interestingly, for somebody who ended up as chair of the Harvard uh, Astronomy Department, you weren't that interested in astronomy when you were young. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, you can think of me more as a farm boy this, than as a Harvard uh, astronomer. That would be a better title because I grew up on a farm and, uh, and that um, led to two things. First, I was connected to nature much more than to people. So I don't have any footprint on social media right now. I don't care how many likes I get on Twitter. Uh, and of course I'm connected to nature, meaning that I would like to understand the reality we all share. And in particular, I want to look through the window and figure out if we have smarter kids on our block. Uh, we can argue forever sitting on the sofa, whether we are the smartest in the world. But in my view, Albert Einstein was probably not the smartest scientist that ever lived since the Big Bang. Most stars from billions of years before the sun, and there must have been a scientist smarter than Einstein that lived on another planet far away, probably more than a billion years ago. And that civilization that benefited from the wisdom of that scientist could have sent equipment and uh, vehicles that uh, survey the entire Milky Way galaxy. They may be around us. And uh, the only way to find out is by looking through our windows rather than arguing. So um, that's one thing that I learned from my childhood to maintain my curiosity because the most vivid memory I have is sitting at the dinner table, asking a difficult question and the adults in the room would dismiss the question simply because they didn't know the answer. So I thought by going into science, I will be able to figure out answers to my questions. And the second thing uh, I uh, got from my childhood was the love of the big questions. Uh, that was the love of philosophy. I was very much into philosophy, except I grew up in Israel and uh, uh, there is an obligatory service in the military at age 18. And I had two choices, either to pursue physics, which meant intellectual pursuit closer to philosophy or to run in the field with a gun attached to my back. And I prefer the first option. And as a result, I ended up with a PhD in physics at age 24. And then uh, uh, I was offered a postdoc fellowship at Princeton, the Institute for Advanced Study that led to a faculty position at Harvard. And uh, by the time I got tenured at Harvard, even though I felt it was an arranged marriage, um, I realized that I'm married to my true love, 
because in astrophysics, you can ask big questions. And one of them is, are we the smartest kid on the block? Let's get into that by having you and, and understanding too, a, a lot of folks who are watching and listening tonight and uh, seeing it on the web later, um, won't really have a basic idea of what's covered in your book, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or the evidence for what began on September 6th, 2017. Can we begin there? And can you explain what happened beginning on that date? Right, so uh, in October uh, 2017, uh, the first object from outside the solar system was noticed near Earth uh, by a telescope in Hawaii on Mount Aleakala. Uh, the telescope is called PANSTARS. And actually I visited that observatory a few months earlier we didn't know that there is an object heading our way uh, that came from outside the solar system back then. And a few months later, uh, it was announced. And uh, it was exciting to me because a decade earlier, uh, I wrote the first paper that forecasted how many such objects, how many rocks from other planetary systems like the solar system we should expect to detect with this telescope. And the answer was none. Uh, so the fact that we detected it was quite exciting, but, and of course the astronomer said, oh, well, uh, it's probably a comet because comets are those icy rocks that uh, exist in the outskirts of the solar system. So they are very loosely bound to the sun and every now and then one of them comes close to the sun and the ice evaporates and you end up with a cometary tail, a trail of gas and dust following the, uh, around the object. And, right. uh, there was nothing around this object that looked like a comet we have seen before. So, so the unusual thing is it didn't look like a comet, didn't look like an asteroid, just a bare rock. And I can get into more details, but uh, so it was really remarkable that the first object we find from outside the solar system does not look like anything we have seen before. Uh, the reason I, by the way, just to clarify that I mentioned September 6th is I think that was when the object interviewed the, uh, intersected the, uh, the solar plane. And that would be the first time, which I kind of find, I, I had to step back and think, I guess that's right. We had never before seen anything in our solar system of extra, extra solar origins, something from outside of our solar system. So this was a first. Right. And uh, uh, the way we could tell that it came from outside the solar system is that it was moving too fast to be bound mm -hmm. to the sun. So, uh, of course, we were looking at the time, I mean, the Pan-STARRS telescope was designed to find objects that may hit the Earth. Uh, NASA was tasked by the US Congress to find 90% uh, of all objects bigger than 140 meters, the size of a football field, that could uh, uh, come very close to Earth or hit it because we still have a trauma from 66 million years ago when the dinosaurs went mm -hmm. extinct. Uh, the Chicxulub impactor basically uh, uh, created a catastrophe here on earth and we want to avoid that. So uh, unlike the dinosaurs that were very arrogant and were not very smart, they couldn't design telescopes, we can warn ourselves. Uh, and that's what the um, Pan-STARRS telescope was aiming to do. So it was looking for objects moving roughly at the speed that we expect from objects in the solar system. There came Oumuamua, which means a scout in the Hawaiian language, this object that was discovered, and it was moving faster, and uh, but not much faster. It's possible there are objects moving close to the speed of light. Astronomers would never find them because they would think, oh, something is wrong with the telescope. They're not sampling the sky that often. So what I'm saying is we were looking for something familiar. Then we saw something that came from outside the solar system. So the first assumption would be to say, well, it's a, it, it came from another star that has rocks around it, just like the sun has. It didn't look like those rocks that we have seen before in the solar system. So that was by itself remarkable. And, uh, and then, um, you know, who knows how many other objects are out there because we could see only an object the size of a football field, okay? And NASA never launched any spacecraft as big as a football field, mm -hmm. okay? And there might be a lot of smaller objects passing by. We just don't know. So 
you determined just from its trajectory, from its velocity and from its hyperbolic orbit that this was from outside the solar system. This is October, 2017. It was a tiny, tiny little speck on the Pan-STARRS telescope image. When did you first go, wait a minute, there's, there's something unusual that's happening with this object? Well, that was in June, 2018. Uh, when a, a team of astronomers reported that this object is pushed away from the sun by some mysterious force. Now, it didn't have a cometary tail, therefore it couldn't be the rocket effect that you see in comets. Uh, so the question was, what, what is pushing it? You know, if it's just bare rock that is not evaporating, how come it's being pushed away from the sun? Um, and in addition to that, we knew that uh, the amount of light, sunlight reflected from the object changed by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling every eight hours. That meant that the object has an extreme shape. And when trying to fit the variation of light, um, the best fit was obtained with an object that is flat, pancake shaped, not like that uh, cartoon image that uh, an artist produced of a cigar shaped object. Uh, it was more like a piece of paper tumbling in the wind. And when you look at a piece of paper sideways, even though it's flat, you see it like a cigar, okay, when, when it's sideways. So that's why the artist had that impression. But um, the point is, this was a very unusual object in terms of its shape, and then it was pushed away. And at that point, I said to myself, well, it's just too much, okay? That, uh, at that point, I said, what could push it? And I, the only thing I could think of is the reflection of sunlight. But well, in order, for, in order I, for that to be effective, the object had to be very thin. Ordinarily, we would think, and I think that some, uh, some other scientists believe that the object was comet-like and that, well, somehow material is boiling off of this as it does off of comets and give it a little bit of a push. But what you're saying is this object was deviating from plain old Newtonian mechanics. And you're going, ah, this is not following the trajectory we would predict. Okay, that happens with comets. And yet this was not comet-like, correct? Right. right, and also if you wanted to give it the appropriate push using standard cometary evaporation, about a 10th of the mass of this object had to evaporate. So a substantial fraction of it, and we would definitely see it if it was a regular comet. And the Spitzer Space Telescope looked very carefully around this object didn't find any traces of carbon-based molecules. So the limits were very tight and it couldn't be a standard comet. So what did my colleagues do? They said, it must be a natural object. After I said it may be artificial, they said, no, it must be a natural. And there was actually a group of experts uh, and I call them experts, quote unquote, because they insisted that it must be natural in a review paper that was published in the Nature Astronomy magazine, a very prestigious journal. And then a few months later, some uh, other team said, oh yeah, it is possibly natural uh, as long as it's made of pure hydrogen. So because hydrogen is transparent, we can't see it. So it's, it evaporates and perhaps that it, that's what it is, a chunk of frozen hydrogen, hydrogen iceberg. We've never seen something like that. We don't know if nature makes hydrogen icebergs, but uh, I wrote a paper afterwards saying such a, an iceberg would evaporate very quickly. Hydrogen can evaporate just by absorbing starlight and it wouldn't survive the journey. So then another team said, oh, maybe it's a cloud of dust particles that uh, is very lightweight and a uh, hundred times less dense than air. And it just floats out there and reflects sunlight and therefore getting pushed. The only problem there is when it gets close to the sun, it it would get heated by hundreds of degrees and would not maintain its integrity. Um, so then there was another suggestion, maybe it's a nitrogen iceberg that was chipped off the surface of a planet like Pluto. And the problem there is the mass budget. There is just not enough solid nitrogen available in the entire Milky Way galaxy to make a large population of chips such that we will see one of them. So for each of these cases, there was an issue. Uh, and I suggested that it's a very thin object that reflects sunlight and therefore gets pushed. And in September, 2020, three years later, there was another object discovered by the same telescope in Hawaii. And it was given the name 2020 SO, and it shared the same qualities 
as Oumuamua, in the sense that it was pushed away from the sun by reflecting sunlight, no cometary tail. But within a few weeks, the astronomers did realize, oh, actually, if we trace the trajectory back in time, it came from Earth. It's actually a rocket booster from 1966, the oh. NASA launch, and it had thin walls. We know that we produced it, therefore it's artificial. So the question that came to my mind is, who produced Oumuamua? And the way I thought about this entire experience of my colleagues arguing it must be natural without knowing what natural means and then coming up with another rock of a type that we've never seen before, it reminded me of, of a story of a cave dweller that finds a cell phone, okay? So when the cave dweller looks at the cell phone, he would say, well, it's shiny. It doesn't look like any rock I've seen before. So, you know, maybe it's a rock of a type I've never seen before. But of course, if he presses a button, he would realize that it can record his voice and then it's not a rock. And uh, if you think about a cave dweller visiting New York City or Manhattan, um, you know, after that experience coming back to the tribe, that cave dweller will uh, uh, talk about what uh, had been seen, but would not be able to reproduce that. Uh, it would be like magic. I mean, it will become a myth, a, a story, a legend. And, um, you know, for us to understand what another technological civilization might have produced a billion years ago, it might be very challenging. But the first thing for us to do is figure out whether it's natural or artificial in origin. Are we likely to gather any more evidence about Oumuamua, or have we gathered all the evidence there is to gather? Well, the problem is by now it's a million times fainter than it was close to us, so we can't really see it, mm -hmm. and we cannot chase it. It's too far away. Yeah, I'm thinking uh, more about going back and, and canvassing, you know, uh, all of the, uh, the satellites, everything that we had that might have intersected its field of vision. Well, that was done, and uh, okay. that's the information we have. It's just not enough. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, a picture is worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book, Extraterrestrial. <laughs> I wouldn't need to write the book if we had just a single image of this object of the type that the artist uh, illustrated. And uh, that's actually uh, my objective right now. I'm leading a project called the Galileo Project. And one of its goals is to design a space mission that will rendezvous with the next Oumuamua. It's sort of like going on a date and you like the person, but then the person disappears, okay? So then you're trying to date the next Oumuamua. Um, and that could be expensive actually, uh, because uh, sending a space mission uh, to come close to the next Oumuamua would cost at least half a billion dollars. So you have to select very well who you are dating, uh, but that's within the realm of possibilities. And that's what the Galileo project aims to do. That's one branch of the Galileo project. There is a second branch, which is to study objects closer to Earth uh, that the government was talking about in a report delivered by the Director of National Intelligence to Congress in June 2021. And as a result of that, President Biden signed into law in December 2021, uh, a new office in government that will start operations in June this year. So the government is putting money into the assembly of data on unusual objects that it cannot figure out the nature of. And I'm just saying scientists should attempt to explain the nature of these objects. This is an obligation that we owe to society, to the government to figure out, to clear up the fog, to use, to get, use telescopes to get more data. And it's not a philosophical question. It's just a question of getting better data. Just like Galileo Galilei argued, he told the philosophers at the time, four centuries ago, look through my telescope and you'll realize that the earth moves around the sun. And they said, no, we don't need your telescope. And they put him in house arrest. Today, they would have canceled him on social media. And my point is, it doesn't really matter what these philosophers said. If you were to ask them to design a mission that will get to Mars, they would never get there because they thought that Mars moves around the Earth, okay? So reality is whatever it is. Uh, nobody remembers those philosophers today, even though they were much more powerful politically relative to Galileo at the time. Reality is whatever it is. If we don't look through our windows, our neighbors will not go away. 
I, you know, in the course of your book, you had uh, you had discussed the odds of this being a natural object, and I believe those odds ended up at somewhere between a million to a billion to one, or even more than that. That's the odds of it being a natural object. But is there any way, and correct me in any of this if I'm wrong, but is there any way in calculating the odds that it came from an intelligent extraterrestrial civilization? Well, so I follow the uh, method of Sherlock Holmes, uh, the, fic uh, the fictional uh, detective, um, in the sense that, you know, just like in the story about the, the cave dweller, it will not, it, it's not clear that we will figure out the nature of an artificial object if the technological gap is too big. You know, if the gap is relatively small, we can figure it out. If they were at roughly the same technological stage as we are, for example, we sent out Voyager and in a billion years, someone may find it. And, you know, the, if they are at the same stage as we are right now, they would understand what it was meant for. But if the gap is huge, you know, if the gap is a million years or a billion years between the civilization that developed those technologies and us, we wouldn't be able to figure it out. Uh, but my point is, we don't need to figure it out. All we need to do is follow Sherlock Holmes, basically put the possibilities on the table. So what are the possibilities? Either an object is natural. It's a rock, it's a, a bird, if you find it in the atmosphere, you know, um, or it's an atmospheric phenomena in the atmosphere, like a lightning or something. So you look at these possibilities and you basically get good enough data that would rule them out. You are definitely sure it's not a bird and it's not a rock, okay? And then the second possibility, it was made by humans. It's human made. So uh, again, we know what, which technologies we possess, uh, including other nations. We have good espionage. We pretty much know where science is right now. And if the object doesn't seem to behave, in a way that we can reproduce with our technologies, it's not human made, okay? So that's the second thing you can rule out. And then as Sherlock Holmes said, what has, whatever is left on the table must be the truth, okay? And uh, so it must be of artificial technological origin if it's not natural and if it's not human made. And uh, then of course, the second question is, okay, uh, what is the intent of this, of this thing? I mean, if it's de defunct, if it's just like a plastic bottle on the, on the beach that you find that is not uh, working anymore, and um, that, that is probably the most common form of things like the Voyager that you will find a billion years later, uh, but it could also be operational. It could, I, don't, I cannot imagine biological creatures in it because they won't survive for such a long time, a journey through interstellar space. But I can imagine artificial intelligence, AI astronauts. We have AI systems driving cars. We can imagine AI astronauts. And uh, those would be completely autonomous. They would not need guidance from the senders. The distance to the senders is probably huge. So they don't have time, patience to wait for that. So they would learn from experience and basically follow the blueprint that they were designed to follow. And these would be intelligent systems. And it, we might need to use our own AI systems to figure out their AI systems. And you know, I, we should think about our AI systems as our technological kids, you know, and that's what our future in space would be in, in my view. It's not those illusions about a huge community of people on Mars or in space. I, you know, I don't share that vision uh, of Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. Um, in my view, our future in space is that of AI astronauts. And because they can survive for long times, mm -hmm. long journeys, they can carry the torch uh, of our consciousness and, and fulfill what we wish to accomplish far away. And we should be proud of our tech. I, you know, I'm not, I have no problem being proud of an AI system as much as I'm proud of my daughters. <laughs> Um, and having read your book, that, that is saying something. Uh, I think that your reference to Sherlock Holmes is because of his maximum that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable much must be the truth. But have we really eliminated the impossible in 
saying there is absolutely no way this is a natural as opposed to intelligently created object. No, not in the case of Oumuamua and not in the case of uh, these unidentified objects that the director of national intelligence is talking about. Um, so my point is uh, f- for us to be confident about the nature of these objects, we need more evidence, yes. more data. Uh, it's not a philosophical question. And therefore, you know, the current situation is very unhealthy where, you know, the government is unclear about what these objects are. If it had a hint that they were made by the Russians or the Chinese, it would never discuss them in front of Congress because the purpose of the intelligence agencies is to figure out what the Chinese and Russians are doing. So it will be as if they admit they can't do their job kind of. Um, so they really are puzzled. Okay, and um, and then uh, uh, we need a scientist. We have an obligation to clear out the, the fog and figure out what these things are. And I think the path forward is by collecting more data. Unfortunately, most of my colleagues in, in academia are ridiculing the subject and having a stigma on it, pushing it aside. And that's not a good situation because, uh, you know, without getting better data, we will never know what these objects are. And then the public will continue to speculate. And, you know, for example, we don't know what most of the matter in the universe is, and we call it dark matter. And over the past 40 years, physicists and astronomers invested hundreds of millions of dollars, or maybe even billions of dollars in experiments that were aimed to find the dark matter. And we are empty handed after 40 years. And it's because it's a search in the dark. We don't know what that that matter is. And that's most of the matter in the universe. Now, if we did find out that it's weakly interacting massive particles, it would have very little impact on the daily lives of most people. However, if we were to find that Oumuamua is definitely an artifact created by an advanced technological civilization, it would have a huge impact on the future of humanity. So how can we avoid investing hundreds of millions of dollars or even billions of dollars over a period of 40 years before jumping to conclusions? That to me sounds like non-scientific. And unfortunately, a lot of scientists promote that uh, argument. They say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. My point is extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. You know, we invested billions of dollars, didn't find the dark matter. We invested $1.1 billion in the LIGO experiment before we could detect gravitational waves. Without investing that, we would never find gravitational waves. So you can't on the one hand say, I don't have extraordinary evidence. And uh, on the other hand say, I don't want to invest in this search. Why is there a reluctance on the part? Let me step back one step. How likely is it, in your view, that there are civilizations, extraterrestrial civilizations, either now in Earth time or over the past billion years, that there is intelligent extraterrestrial life in the universe? What are the odds? I think it's very, very likely. Um, And the reason I say that is out of modesty. You see, we in the past, if you look at human history, we argued we are at the center of of the universe because it flattered our ego. That's a virtual reality that gives us pleasure. And then we realized, no, we are not at the center of the stage. Then we argued, okay, well, what we find in the solar system, the earth sun system is maybe privileged, unique. And now we know that half of the sun-like stars have a planet the size of the earth, roughly at the same separation. Um, So we have this tendency to get attached to virtual realities that give us a very prominent place in the universe. And I can understand where it's coming from because both my daughters thought that they are the smartest in the block when they were young, before, before we took them to the kindergarten. And then they had a psychological shock seeing other kids that might be smarter than they are. So it's very natural for humans. You know, when we are born, we get most of the data about our immediate vicinity. And in that vicinity, we are really the smartest. But as we uh, mature, we realize there is a bigger world out there. Now, many people prefer not to mature to basically believe in virtual reality, to put goggles on their head that will give them access to the metaverse where they can be much better looking than they are in reality. They can have all the attributes that they cannot obtain in the actual reality. 
they can be at the center of the universe in the metaverse. This is a natural tendency and it's not a new phenomenon. Um, it started uh, a long time ago. And uh, you know that's also the motivation for taking recreational drugs where you feel much better about yourself if you are not witnessing the actual reality. But as a scientist, I really want to see the pimples on the face of reality. I don't want any makeup. You know, I'm in love with the reality that we all share. And I want to figure it out by getting more information about it. If you are in love with the subject, you want to know as much as possible about this subject. That's real love. Uh, rather than imagining things that provide us pleasure about that subject. And but, but do you yeah. think scientists are susceptible to that frame of reference as well, where they don't even want to consider a search for extraterrestrial intelligence because it somehow offends their sensibilities? Well, yeah. So that, that what I mentioned before, uh, our natural tendency to feel uh, privileged, superior, that's one aspect of it. A second is uh, that a lot of people uh, work for years, you know, or decades to become experts. And that includes scientists. They you know, they establish a reputation of knowing all the facts on a subject such that they are considered an authority. So imagine someone that for decades worked on rocks in the solar system, and then you come and say, well, this doesn't look like the rocks we've seen before. Maybe it's not a rock. And that offends the expert. The expert wants to portray an image of someone who knows the answer based on the past knowledge. The expert doesn't want to be surprised doesn't want to risk the reputation by considering something that is outside the realm of what we have witnessed before. But if you, if you just think about a century ago, we discovered quantum mechanics. That was completely unexpected. It was uh, provided to us by experiments. And even Einstein had problems understanding the true meaning of quantum mechanics. He was talking about spooky action at a distance, which turns out to be real and he was wrong. Uh, and so my point is, we, we need to think of ourselves as students and nature is teaching us. But, and the only way for us to learn is first be modest, not be arrogant, not think we know the answer in advance without looking through our telescope, without looking through our windows. And the second is, you know, um, doing the experiments that provide us with that evidence. That's the way to learn. And you know, I, I'm um, at the end of this week, I will become uh, 60 years old. And the biggest lesson that I've learned in 60 years, I, I learned actually three lessons, but the biggest among them is how important it is to stay uh, modest every morning when you wake up, rather than being proud of your past accomplishments, just think about how much time is left for you to live on this earth and try to make the best out of it rather than reminisce about the accomplishments of the past and regard yourself as an expert and pretend that you know the answers in advance. You know, all of these maneuvers may impress your colleagues. You may get more likes on Twitter, but it would not bring you to a better understanding of the reality that we all share. So I think it's really important to, to learn. It's really important for us to be modest. That's the first thing that we, we need to, to learn. Um, and and I, it took me a while to figure this out. It's not as if, you know, at a young age, I, it was obvious to me. And I'm just giving you my, my most important lesson. I have two more, but we can get into them afterwards. Well, to, to, get, to return to kind of the, uh, an overview of Oumuamua before we leave it behind, because there are some other things that I do want to get to, but the ISSI, the, uh, the International Space Science Institute, came to a conclusion in 2019 that said that we find no compelling evidence to favor an alien explanation for Oumuamua. Why would they, and this is a scientific organization, is the suggestion that they just weren't willing to consider your explanation? Yeah, so they basically declared that the object must be natural. And that was a few months before another team claimed that it should be a hydrogen iceberg. It's natural, but it's a hydrogen iceberg. And then another team claimed it's a cloud of dust particles, a dust bunny. And then another team claimed it's a nitrogen iceberg. So my point is, if it was so obvious that the object is natural, how come the ISSI did not suggest that it's a hydrogen iceberg, a nitrogen iceberg, or a dust bunny? 
They did not mention these possibilities. They just said it's natural. And to me, you know, if that was obvious that it's natural, then these other teams should not have published their papers. And they published their papers in the subsequent year. So uh, it shows how, um, you know, unjustified is the claim that it's a natural object, because the only way to explain it as a natural object is to imagine something we've never seen before. We've never seen a nitrogen iceberg. We've never seen a hydrogen iceberg floating in space or a dust bunny. And, um, you know, um, it reminds me of the story about uh, a book written in the 1930s uh, about um, 100 authors against Einstein's theory of relativity. So Einstein was asked about this book and he said, why would you need a hundred authors? If it, there was a good argument against my theory, one author would be sufficient, you know? And I say the same thing. Why do you need an organization, ISSI, of a group of people coming together to establish a view out of authority? It's enough for one of them to find a simple explanation to all the anomalies of Oumuamua. And they did not provide that explanation. And the proof is that months later, three other groups had to write scientific papers, and not just one, but multiple papers, each of these groups, suggesting something that we've never seen before. So, But an in, in interstellar object to our solar system had never been seen before either. So could that also not have characteristics that are just brand new to us? No, because if you think about the solar system, uh, the periphery of the solar system is the so-called Oort cloud. Mm -hmm. It extends halfway to the nearest star, and it's made of those Lego pieces, the rocks that were left over as the building blocks of the planets that we have in the solar system. Now, if a star passes by, and there are plenty of stars, right now there is a star passing by the solar system, and in the past there were stars passing through the solar system, not just near the solar system. So any, any such passage would dislodge some of these rocks into interstellar space because they are very loosely bound. So if you imagine that the most common objects in interstellar space were born in planetary systems like the solar system and dislodged into interstellar space from the outskirts, you would expect it to be a comet. And that's what people expected the Muamua to be. And uh, if you imagine it being a hydrogen iceberg or a nitrogen iceberg, it means that there is a nursery that makes objects at very large abundance in a way that we've never witnessed. I the see. only way for us to imagine pieces of rock being produced is in protoplanetary disks that make planets like the solar system. I see. Um, let me take it a bit away from Oumuamua and ask you if we had never seen an extrasolar object come into the solar system until October 2017, now we've seen two or three. Um, why have we all of a sudden begun seeing these things? Oh, that's very simple. We didn't have the telescopes that allow hmm. us to see it. So for example, 70 years ago, uh, Enrico Fermi, a famous physicist that won the Nobel Prize, um, had lunch at Los Alamos with friends and they were talking about extraterrestrials. And he said, well, indeed, it's quite possible that they're out there. But where is everybody? We don't see them. Now, to me, that's very presumptuous. It's like someone sitting on the sofa at home and saying, I don't have neighbors because I don't hear anyone knocking on my door. Well, guess what? The chance that you are sitting on the sofa and someone will knock on your door is pretty small. You know, recorded human history is just 10,000 years old. And that's a millionth of the age of the solar system, okay? Mm -hmm. And Enrico Fermi sits in Los Alamos over one lunch and thinks, oh, I don't see anyone, therefore, you know, where is everybody? And more, most importantly, he didn't use telescopes to look around. So it's just like a fisherman sitting on the beach and saying, where are all the fish, you know? Uh, if you don't use a fishing net, you will not catch anything. So uh, Pan So what's gonna, what is going Pan to be our fishing net? For... Yeah, so Panstas was the first fishing net uh, for objects as big as a football field mm. uh, passing within the orbit of the Earth around the sun. You need the object to come close enough so that it reflects enough sunlight for the telescope to see. And so that means the object needs to be big enough, the size of a football field or bigger, 
and it needs to pass within the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. And PANSTARS was really the first survey telescope that allowed us to find such objects, okay. and it found Oumuamua. Now, how, also, would you, how would you like to see that expanded? Do you have in view something we should be doing that if you were in charge of Earth, that you would say, here's what we need to do now to anticipate and study the next one? Is that a possibility? Definitely. I mean, we have already a telescope plan to start operations in a year uh, in Chile called the Vera Rubin Observatory. It will be much more sensitive than pan stars and could discover Oumuamua-like objects every few months. That's based on recent estimates. Is there any, but, how, how good will the resolution of that be? Would it answer the question as to whether or not it's of uh, intelligent design? No, uh, because um, no telescope on earth can resolve an object the size of a football field roughly at the earth sun separation. What you need is to send a camera that will pass very close to it within a thousand kilometers, which is one of the goals of the Galileo project. Oh, well, that but, would be worth it, I think. Well, you've got yeah, my definitely. vote. <laughs> no, definitely. But I should say one thing that, you know, the defense budget that was signed into law uh, late in December uh, was for $768 billion, okay? And if you think about it, you know, it's just to protect the United States against other nations. So people against other people, just like kids playing in the playground, you know, with toys. Um, and imagine those kids seeing a car passing in the street. That would be amazing to them. There must be something going on far away from this playground. So if the Galileo project would find an artificial object, I think it's conceivable that the political system would say, wait a minute, there is something going on out there. Maybe we should allocate the same amount of money that we allocate for defense against other people to figure out you know, what kind of technological civilizations we have in our neighborhood. And that would mean a trillion dollars a year. That's thousands of times more than allocated to any major scientific project, thousands of times more. So imagine, suppose we put as much attention to our neighbors as we put to our human neighbors, so to speak, we would have thousands of times more money to science. And then what would we do with it? Well, obviously we would be, build much bigger telescopes uh, and send probes into space that could look around and uh, check what is in our neighborhood. And I don't think it's far-fetched. You know, I think if we do find evidence, you know, we are taking a path uh, that was not taken, like in the poem of Robert Frost, and that made all the difference to Robert Frost. In my case, uh, the advantage of taking the path not taken with the Galileo project is that there may be low hanging fruit out there. Nobody took that path. There was never a scientific project of building telescopes to find the nature of objects that come close to earth and find out whether they are technolo technological in origin. There was never such a scientific project. So there is a chance we will find low hanging fruit simply because nobody picked up those fruits and nobody walked in that path. Just to set out the probabilities, not that I think that we can settle on a specific number, but I think in the Milky Way galaxy, there's something like, is this right? 50 billion Earth-like in terms of temperature distance from their own star, 50 billion solar systems just in the Milky Way that have Earth-like characteristics? Yeah, but the issue is, uh, I think the biggest issue is how long will our civilization survive mm -hmm. uh, technology, you know, as, as, uh, as a result of, um, for example, uh, self-inflicted wounds, you know, can destroy us. And uh, usually when um, you ask yourself, how much time do I have left? Uh, you're roughly in the middle of your life. You know, that's the most typical situation. In, in your first day as a baby, you have very small chance of asking this question, one in 10,000, because there are 10,000 days in the life of an adult. So most of the time you are likely to be in the middle of, the, of your life. And, and if we are in the middle of our technological life, we just have a few more centuries to go and that's it. So if the window is so narrow, uh, if we don't take care of our planet, okay? If some catastrophe will take place and we will go extinct. And if that's the fate of any technological civilization, then there may not be any other right now in the Milky Way galaxy, unless they sent something out of their planet, you see? So there is a competition here between the damage we cause, we inflict on our immediate environment 
and our ability to launch things, AI astronauts into space. If we manage to send out everything we care about, you know, in terms, even in terms of information, you know, just AI systems that carry that information with them so they can reconstruct whatever we have here on earth elsewhere, then we are saved in some sense because these would be monuments that would last for a long time. You know, I'm really uh, disappointed and I should say embarrassed by what we sent with New Horizons. The New Horizons mission was aimed to visit Pluto, mm-hmm. okay? And uh, the, the scientist who discovered Pluto is Clyde Tambao, and uh, they, therefore they put a box inside, NASA put a box inside New Horizons that carried 30 grams of the ashes of Clyde Tambao to commemorate him. And I thought to myself, that makes no sense because what are ashes? They are burned up DNA. So you take the genetic information about the person you want to commemorate and you destroy it. Those ashes are no different than the ashes of a cigarette. And if an extraterrestrial would find this box, it would be really embarrassing. So because that extraterrestrial would say, what is this uh, primitive ritual that humans have? And actually it's their scientific organization, NASA, that sent it. So they must be proud of these primitive rituals of destroying the genetic information on a person they want to commemorate. Uh, So my idea is to send a spacecraft that will overtake New Horizons and will just apologize for that box and say, you know, don't worry about it. Well, I mean, on I believe on Voyager One, there's a recording of Johnny B. Good, and I don't I I don't know if that's good or bad, but <laughs> <laughs> well, I I would argue that the, any music from the '60s is not as good as music we have now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, that's just a whisker of time. Um, so the suggestion, if I'm following you on this, is that what we saw in October 2017 could have been a solar sail from an advanced civilization that may not even exist. In fact, probably doesn't exist anymore, but it's an artifact of their own technology and their own civilization. And you're suggesting we should be set up to receive these, to detect the next one and to determine yay or nay, natural or non-natural. Is that basically right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, we should uh, collect uh, enough evidence to convince us And then, of course, if it turns out to be functional, if it has, for example, an AI system, there is no protocol right now how to respond to it, how to engage with it. There is no international organization that will represent humanity. And it's very different from protocols that were thought about in the past, where if we were to discover a radio signal from a distant civilization, you know, the nearest star to us is four light years away. So a round trip takes 80 years for light. And the stars across the Milky Way galaxy are tens of thousands of light years away. So we have plenty of time to think how to respond to that. But if you have a visitor in your backyard, you have to decide immediately what to do about it. And that depends on the intent. It depends on the details. And by the way, I had an interesting conversation about that with Henry Kissinger. I asked him, uh, how would you apply real politic to dealing with a society or a civilization or a sender um, whose nature you don't know? You don't know what the intent of that sender was. And for him, it was a question uh, similar to that, that he can address based on his experience with China or Russia. And he suggested that first thing is to try and understand what their aim is, what uh, their goals are, what their motivation is, uh, and adapt to that. Uh, That is, will they be good guys or bad guys? I mean, it's basically that question. Well, but uh, you have to keep in mind that the the city of Troy citizens uh, misjudged the horse, right? So it's not always obvious (laughs) what the purpose uh, on face value is. Understood. It, we're getting to that point of the program, in fact, we passed it, where we've got a lot of uh, folks who are watching tonight who have some questions, um, and this has gone like that, but I'm going to launch into some of the questions that we've gotten from folks who are listening tonight. And one, Dr. Loeb, is, by the way, we're talking with Dr. Avi Loeb, who is the author of Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth, a provocative title from uh, uh, a Harvard astronomer. 
Um, and the question is, you've noticed a large amount of opposition in the scientific community to your suggestion about this being of non-natural origin. Who are some of the people and organizations who agree with your assessment? Oh, well, first of all, when I uh, announced the Galileo project in July uh, 2021, and um, as a result of um, a few multi-billionaires who came to the porch of my home and were inspired <laughs> by the book, and they basically donated $2 million to my research funds at Harvard. You never see such things in academia that people come to you and, said, and offer money. Often you have to work really hard to convince people to contribute to your research. So that was a surprise to me. And then I um, uh, had the opportunity to establish the Galileo project. And, um, and then uh, more than a hundred scientists volunteered to contribute to the project. You know, so that already is testimony. As one of them said, you know, I was waiting for many years to speak freely on this subject and to study it scientifically. And it's a breath of fresh air to be able to address this question based on the scientific method. So the Galileo project is founded on donations that were not allocated to any other scientific project to start with. So we're not taking money from other projects. And moreover, it's based on collecting evidence that using the scientific method, not without any prejudice. I established a very big tent that includes people that uh, want to believe that some objects are of extraterrestrial technological origin and others that are skeptics because it doesn't really matter what, what your starting position is. The idea is that the evidence will guide, will unite us once it's clear. And I want to have both people on my team so that I will not miss any argument. And then uh, I would like to see them converge. You see, it's not like politics where you can help hold your view irrespective of uh, any uh, data or, but here in science, if there is a clear uh, evidence for one way or another, both sides will converge. And, and uh, that would be a beautiful illustration of how science works. So my point is we are following the scientific method. We're using funds that were not allocated to science before. How can a scientist have a problem with that? Okay. Um, and to me, Oumuamua was just a wake up call. I'm not saying that we know definitely it was artificial, but it's a wake up call in the sense of here is an area of research that uh, would have tremendous implications for society, for the future of humanity that was not addressed scientifically so far, that the government is investing funds in, okay? And that the public is extremely interested in. And the fact that my book became bestseller is evidence for that. And it was translated to 25 languages. So you have the public and the government interested. How can scientists in academia ridicule the subject or say that something like the Galileo project is a waste of time without collecting the evidence to guide them? I'm saying, suppose we find that it's natural in origin, okay, objects like Oumuamua, or we find that all these unidentified aerial phenomena are just human made, okay? Suppose we find it. I still think we uh, did a very good service to society in clearing up this puzzle once and for all, so that we will stop speculating about it. We will stop ridiculing it. You know, it's just like a thousand years ago, people argued the human body has a soul. Therefore, anatomy should be forbidden. So imagine if scientists would say, we don't want to engage in this subject because there is nonsense being said about the human body, that it has a soul and so forth. We don't want to even discuss it. Uh, then where would modern medicine be? Uh, we scientists opened the human body and figured out how it works. And that led to modern medicine. Uh, it didn't damage the soul in the body of humans. We realized it after we opened the body. And so in, in much the same way, by collecting evidence on these objects, we will figure out what they are. And who cares if people in the past said nonsense about these objects? L let me tread carefully with my next question, which is possibly the reason why a lot of scientists are reluctant to go down that path. Um, while I can understand the fascination of this object that came in and objects since Oumuamua have come in um, to examine them, to find out what's going on with them. Uh, are you also suggesting that things that we have seen terrestrially, let's, well, we saw those terrestrially, UFOs, some of the, some of the sightings that we've seen lately where even the government's going, we don't quite know what that is. 
Uh, is the suggestion that we should also investigate that to the yeah. extent that we can scientifically? So um, in the next few months, we're uh, planning to assemble a telescope system. The Galileo project is mm -hmm. assembling a telescope system that includes uh, infrared cameras, optical cameras, radio sensors, audio sensors, that will basically take a video of the sky all the time, the entire sky, once it operates, and it will have also artificial intelligence algorithms that will identify objects like a bird, distinguish it from a drone, distinguish mm. it from an airplane um, or an atmospheric phenomena. Once we have that oper operational, uh, we will make copies of this system and place them in many locations, trying to see if there are objects uh, whose nature is unclear. And if so, what are they? And collecting scientific evidence on them rather than relying on military uh, reports. Now, again, uh, my approach is very similar to that of a kid. I don't care what people within my home or family uh, said about it before. I don't care what my parents said about it, what previous generations said about it, what you know, that's not relevant because mm -hmm. if it's out there, uh, you know, science is about reproducibility of results, okay? Mm -hmm. If it's out, I'm not going back to mythical stories, you know, from ancient times. If it's out there, we will find it, okay? And if we don't find it, forget about it. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to use telescopes to figure out the nature of any object that we find in the sky, either close to earth or coming from outside the solar system. And so would it, this Galileo system, would the, the one that you're putting into place, would have detected Oumuamua? No, no. So that would be to study unidentified aerial phenomena that were reported by the Director of National Intelligence to Congress. And then the second branch of the Galileo project is to design a space mission that will come, that will rendezvous with the next Oumuamua. That's yes. much more expensive. The, mm -hmm. the first task would cost about $100 million. Mm -hmm. The second task could cost somewhere between half and one billion dollars. Uh, but both of them are complementary. I mean, these are two different tasks. And right. then, uh, the goal is that, you know, once, um, for example, with a space mission, we want to design the trajectory that is best mm -hmm. uh, to take in order to rendezvous an incoming object like Oumuamua. We want to design the instruments that would be put on such a, a space mission. And so um, that takes time. And in the coming months, that's what we aim to do. And my hope is that within the coming uh, year or two, we'll start having data that will tell us something about, at least about the unidentified aerial phenomena. At the same time, the government will have an office, okay? Uh, assembling data that was collected by military personnel. And most of the data is classified. And uh, I'm not waiting for that data to be released because it's just like, Samuel Beckett's uh, play, Waiting for Godot. You know, if you wait for the government to release and declassify data, you can wait forever. Mm -hmm. And it makes much more sense to collect your data on your own. Uh, you know, just like a kid wants to figure out the world, the kids go, goes out and, and, and looks at things and tries them and, uh, and learns on, on his or her own. And I think that is the attitude that science should adopt. Um, and so we are building our own telescopes. We will try to, the sky is not classified. It's only the instruments that the government was using. So we will figure out what is out there. Okay, I have to ask you two questions. How often would an Oumuamua-like object, something from outside of our solar system, an interstellar object, how often would we expect to see something like that once we have this in place and the Panstar system is already in place? And once we have, if we had, the intersection with it, the spending the, you know, the money that we would need to spend to send a probe out there, would it answer your question as to whether it was natural or non-natural? Yes. So for the first question, if we continue to use pan stars, uh, we found Oumuamua after a few years, okay? And so the expectation is that every few years we'll find one, okay? It's just like going to the kitchen and finding an ant, if I find it on a small portion of the file cabinet, I know that there must be many more ants out there because I surveyed just a small portion of the cabinet. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the Vera Rubin Observatory will be much more sensitive than pan stars. It could discover many more Oumuamua-like objects, so one, once every few months. Now, this assumes that they are random, that, you know, that it's not as if we had one by chance 
uh, and that's it, uh, that they are, you know, coming, um, there is a population out there and we saw sort of a typical member of that population. Um, and by the way, if they are on random trajectories, then there should be a quadrillion of them in the solar system right now, uh, given the statistics about Oumuamua. So that a quadrillion is 10 to the power 15 because they're moving relatively slowly. You know, that it takes time for, uh, it takes uh, tens of thousands of years for them to cross the entire Oort cloud. So there are plenty of them within the solar system right now, if they, unless it was a directed uh, equipment that, that meant, was meant to visit the habitable zone of the solar system to figure out if there is life, intelligent life in it. Uh, if it was that kind of a thing, there, there would be many fewer than I mentioned. I see. And then to the second question, which is, if we had everything up and running and intersected with one of these objects, would it answer yeah. your question? Yeah. In fact, we have a demonstration of that. Uh, NASA launched the OSIRIS-REx mission that landed on an asteroid called Bennu. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took a photograph of it and took a sample that it will bring back to Earth in 2023. And uh, you could see from the image that it's a rock. You could see it made of sand and some small rocks on top of the big rock, you could tell that. So my point is, if you get close enough to an object, just like Osiris-Rex came and landed on Bennu, then you can tell whether it's, it has screws and bolts on it, <laughs> okay? And you can even read off the label made on exoplanet Y, okay? And you can see buttons. You see, personally, I would love to press a button. And in fact, if it's a vehicle, I would love to jump on it and get away from my uh, from from all these uh, uh, unimaginative colleagues in academia. You know, just go to another planet where there might be more open-minded scientists. Yes, I take by that you mean that you got a lot of pushback when your view when your opinion first became known that this might be extraterrestrial intelligence. Well, um, I should say that my wife says that. If they ever land in our backyard, she wants me to do two things. One is to leave the car keys with her. And the second is to make sure that they don't ruin the loan when they take <laughs> off. Now, she also said another thing, uh, just if, since I'm mentioning my wife. Um, there was, uh, I, I was uh, informed of a tweet about me by uh, a man that said that uh, his wife appears to have a crash on a guy named Avi Loeb because she saw him on TV and uh, she finds him a sexier version of Anthony Fauci. And so I told that to my wife and she said, Fauci is a low bar. So she, <laughs> my wife keeps me in place. <laughs> it sounds well, that's, that's the upside of matrimony. Um, <laughs> Dr. Loeb, we've, we've reached that point in the program where we have time for one last question and it's a little off topic or, or maybe it's not. One of the listeners tonight wanted to know if there is a question that keeps you up at night, something that you hope will be solved or discovered in the next few years. Definitely. Um, uh, what, you know, there are, there are fundamental questions that we have about the universe. We know about the Big Bang. You know, the universe started at a point in time. We don't know what preceded that. I would like to know if the Big Bang was produced in the laboratory of an advanced civilization. It's a possibility. If we had a theory that unifies quantum mechanics and gravity, we could have imagined how to produce a baby universe in our laboratory. And as I said to two reverends in the Washington National Cathedral on November 10th, uh, 2021, I said that a sufficiently advanced scientific civilization may be a good approximation to what we used to call God. Interesting. Dr. Loeb, it has been a fascinating hour, and I know you have been talking about this for five years now, and um, it, it doesn't get any less fascinating. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Avi Loeb, author of Extraterrestrial, the First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth. Thank you so much for your time. And by the way, a little bit early, happy birthday. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, you. And thank you. We encourage all of you to pick up a copy of the book at your local bookstore. And if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making in-person and virtual programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash 
events. With CBS News in San Francisco, I'm Brian Hackney on behalf of the Commonwealth Club. Dr. Love, thank you again, and thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.